Welcome everyone. My name is Bray Wheeler and I'm a senior consultant at BrightPath. I'm excited to connect with you today about designing an effective crisis exercise. In this session, we will focus on creating an engaging exercise that adds value and meets your resiliency objectives. We will also touch briefly on other key elements that contribute to successful exercises. Our goal is for this session to spark new ideas that you can use in designing exercises within your organization. Thank you for being here and let's get started. So a little about me to begin. I am, like I said, I am a senior consultant at BrightPath. I have nearly two decades of experience in this space, primarily in intelligence, crisis, and reputation management. Previously, I worked at a Fortune 100 retailer in assets protection, corporate security, crisis management, intelligence, and enterprise risk. My education background is in political science and applied intelligence. So enough about me, let's dig into why we're here. So when we're often asked about exercises, the two most common questions that we're asked when we're talking about designing exercises or building exercises is first, how do we create, facilitate, and evaluate an effective and value-added exercise for our organization? And then clients and others that we talk to follow it up with, and how can we do that without dedicating a ton of time to it? So those are two really important questions. How do you design an exercise that has that right value for your organization and doing it without a ton of time? Those questions speak to some common challenges the we continue to hear from clients and others with exercises. And some of those common challenges include goals aren't aligned to the real needs. You, there's fighting of the scenario in the exercise where participants aren't, aren't engaging, aren't believing, aren't able to put on their kind of imagination hats and pretend that they're somewhere else. They're not necessarily, exercises aren't necessarily structured cross-functionally meaning that oftentimes they might be very specific to an area of the organization or a specific process or something like that. Those are certainly value added, but from an organizational exercise, those have a lot of limitations and often don't lead to good outcomes when you have a lot of folks sitting in a room not participating or not engaged. Often, Building an exercise feels cumbersome, detailed, laborious. There's a lot of work that has to go into it, it feels like. There's questions from participants or other stakeholders, you know, even executives, where they're asking, why are we even doing this? Or do I need to really participate? During an exercise, participants can even get into academic debates where they're going down rabbit holes or somebody is filibustering on a particular topic and not allowing the exercise scenario to progress in the way that it needs to. And then finally, there's often questions around, did we actually learn anything of value? Did we take anything away? Did we actually get better? And these common challenges are common for a reason. We hear them a lot from different organizations and different clients. But it's important to remember that as we walk through this session, that will address many of these common challenges, either directly or indirectly, but a lot of these are pretty easy fixes to make. So let's talk about the typical approach that you see in building an exercise. So when we're talking to folks or we're talking to others that do exercise design, we often hear kind of two, two primary methods of designing an exercise two approaches or two orientation points that sort of anchor a lot of these. One is following um, pretty closely the Homeland Security Exercise and Evaluation Process or HSEEP. So very common method of exercise design. It is publicly facing, particularly, particularly in the US but it has nearly 80 pages of direction on how to execute that type of exercise or that structure of exercise. Now, the purpose of HCP is important. It's that coordination of multiple government agencies and jurisdictions. So in the US, we're talking from federal to state to county 
city, town, school district, all those different jurisdictions can become a part of a crisis response or an emergency response. So it's important to have some sort of structure that allows that coordination of all those different entities that have various powers and decision-making authority and responsibilities to coordinate in a really organized fashion. The problem with HCB is it doesn't translate well to non-government organizations. So the return on investment is really minimal and it's overly focused on that tactical and operational procedures. So you're talking about setting up different sections to address logistics or communications or other things. That doesn't necessarily translate within organizations that have those as a primary operation within their space. So logistics certainly is pretty common within a lot of organizations and different industries, but you're calling it something different and you operate differently. And you don't have to do a whole lot of coordination with other, other organizations or jurisdictions in order to accomplish what you need to do as an organization. Now, that's not to say that those things don't come into play. They certainly do. But you're not setting up a logistics section with your organization and all of your different third-party transportation providers. You're just simply working with them and coordinating with them. You don't need the overhead of setting something like that up. So it's not realistic to what it is that your organization needs. Now, sort of building off HCP in a way, but not necessarily HCP's fault, um, is really looking at organizations or exercises, excuse me, that are fully scripted or fully formed stories. So there's typically laid out in something like a massive spreadsheet document with different detailed playbooks. So each facilitator, actor, or participant has all sorts of different materials in front of them that are unique to that organization or that exercise and not necessarily the resource that they would commonly use in a response. The purpose of that fully scripted story is often it's to help drive participants towards specific outcomes and not necessarily focus on wasting their time. So a lot of that design is, hey, we only have three hours. We're getting a lot of pushback previously in other exercises, or we're really afraid we're going to get that level of pushback from folks that need to participate, that we're wasting their time, or we're not getting anywhere. We're not, you know, finding the right answers, you know, traveling through the right story. That, that can be good in some ways in terms of being fully scripted, especially if you want to drive people towards using a process that might be newer or might be used inconsistently or something like that. You can definitely use that level of detail to help push them to where they, where you need them to go as an organization and in response. But the problem with that is, is it lacks realism and it's really excessive on that resource commitment. So you're trying not to waste other people's time, but you're taking a lot of other people and using their time and their energy and their resources to put together a script that really probably takes months and months of time to accomplish a, you know, a two hour exercise. That's a lot of resource commitment, especially in lean organizations. It also leads to confirmation bias in the plan where you've scripted it to such detail that, of course, the plan is going to work. You've organized it in that way that the plan is absolutely going to work in this scenario, and you've scripted everything to that. Again, that isn't realistic. The crisis or the incident, the situation that you're in is going to have a say in how you respond. So it's really impossible to craft every single detail. No two hurricanes are alike. No two active assailant situations are alike. No two reputation issues are the same. So no matter how much you work to a really detailed process, you're still going to have to adapt and overcome those challenges. It also avoids actual learning or growth. So because people are so keen on, oh, we accomplished the mission, we get a gold star, we did exactly what we were supposed to do, there's no creative thinking. There's no room for error or failure or assumptions to come into play between participants where you can find gaps, you can de-conflict things, you can align things, you can just simply get better 
by having to be more creative or imaginative in your response. So as you can see, these common methods, while really well-intentioned and have some purpose in some specific situations, don't drive that right value for non-government organizations or organizations that are lean or ones that really want to practice as they would play, you know, sort of in the real game, in a real situation. So the challenge overall with exercises, and from our point of view, and certainly this is a pretty blunt statement, but Exercises are really an opportunity to showcase your process and to instill confidence and really drive that engagement and participation and collaboration and team building and learning and creativity and simply learning about the organization. It's a really, really big opportunity where you have a lot of people, oftentimes more senior people in the organization participating in something. And if that exercise sucks and it's not well done and it's not engaging and it doesn't meet some of those things that I've sort of just laid out, it can become poisonous to your organizational resiliency, meaning that those people aren't going to buy into the program or the process or the need for resiliency for a crisis management process, for business continuity, for disaster recovery, intelligence, all sorts of things can really be impacted by exercises that suck. Because again, those that is a prime opportunity to get all those people together and have them really work and see the value in front of them as they're participating in a safe environment. Now, in a real environment, you sort of make do with what you have because you're responding to the thing. But in that safe environment where you can practice and learn in, in a really good way, you want to make sure that these don't suck. So when we think about exercises and we think about designing them, we think there's a more effective approach here in doing that. So often the initial design question, you know, when we're talking to clients or other organizations and we're really digging into, okay, we need to, we're doing an exercise that's coming up. And oftentimes, we're asked, well, what, sh what scenario should we use for that exercise? What should we be doing? I, you know, maybe we should use a data ensign or we should, you know, really do active assailant. That's in the news or, hey, it's hurricane season. Let's do a hurricane. Or we really have a problem with, you know, not getting loaves of bread to our store. We should really make a supply chain issue where we can't get loaves of bread to our store. Those are all great scenarios. They're great starting points. But that necessarily isn't the first question or that initial question that you should be asking. The better design question is, what is the purpose of this exercise? What is it that we're trying to accomplish with this exercise? Are we trying to test our plans? or develop a better understanding of our roles and responsibilities in a safe environment? Are we practicing a specific process that we just developed in our testing out that we really need to make sure that is sort of stress tested and we have some of those wrinkles iron out? Are we developing muscle memory for participants? So is it really meant to be doesn't really matter what the scenario is. We just need them to get into the room together and start working a problem. And they have responsibilities for managing that and need to use those plans and resources. Is there some interplay at st between stakeholders and incident response teams that we need? So do we need to practice with this scenario engaging our crisis management team or whatever it is that you call it in your organization with our executive leadership? or the C-suite, or the ELT, whatever you might call it. We need to understand what that dynamic is going to look like between those groups. So we need to craft the scenario. We need to have a scenario that we can craft that's going to let us accomplish that. Is it just simply about building better relationships or collaboration with each other? Or are we 
looking at issues that we've identified either in a real life or in a previous exercise that we think is an opportunity that our organization isn't ready for, or we need to know if we're ready for. So let's use an issue we've previously identified and make that the basis of the scenario. So there's a lot of different things that you can do with your exercise goals. And again, I've sort of walked through some examples of those and some pretty common ones that we encourage, you know, especially new teams to embrace. We really need to understand what your exercise is about and not necessarily just testing a scenario. Because again, no two scenarios are gonna be the same. So just because you've practiced active assailant, it doesn't mean you're good at it. it doesn't mean you've checked the box there. It does mean you have now some experience with a situation like that, and you've thought through some of the processes, but you need to make sure that that was your purpose. That was the goal of the exercise was to get there, not simply to say, oh, you know, active assailant is very popular in the news, unfortunately. We should practice that. So really think about what those goals and objectives are, and then start to think about what scenario would align well and might be something that your team is ready for. So let's talk about designing the structure of an exercise. So now that we've sort of talked about what some of the goals and objectives are, let's sort of talk about how we go about designing that exercise and what's that structure that you know, we hear a bright path sort of consistently use in the way that we think about it and we design an exercise. So exercises from a baseline structure is really a three act play. And, you know, three acts is pretty common in, in books and in plays and movies and things like that. It's pretty broadly well known. And there's a reason for that because it works. It allows you to tell a story in a lot of different ways that gets you from beginning to end in a really structured way, but with a lot of creativity and a lot of imagination within there. No two, no two books are the same. So the way that we think about this in this three-act structure is there's that inciting incident. So the boom, as we would call it, the thing that happened or the thing that's about to happen that you know is gonna be consequential or very impactful to your organization. Then in move two, it's that midpoint, it's that rising action, it's where the challenge is really introduced here. So the thing has happened, but now in move two, you really have a full understanding of, full understanding of exactly what has happened. And then finally in act three, while typically in movies and books, this is sort of the preeminent point of sort of the, the climax as it's described where you've reached the pinnacle of the story. We, we differ slightly here in act three where we typically use this to shift the mindset from recovery or from response, excuse me, to recovery. I had them flip-flop there. But what we're really talking about is we've been so engaged in that response from Act 1 and Act 2, and we're really trying to address the challenges and things that are happening. We need a way out of the scenario, and Act 3 provides that in a realistic way while also introducing some different nuances and challenges that come with that transition. So we typically use Act 3 as that moment of Perhaps we've jumped in time two weeks, but we're using it to say, look, we've been responding and we've been doing a lot of these things that we've been talking about, and we've been doing really well to the point where the where the scenario or the situation has really begun to die down or the impact has become less. And we now need to start thinking about as a group, how do we make that transition and how do we shift into recovery where we want to get back to normal operations? And that's a really important part of a response that you want to make sure in an exercise you get to. So again, from just kind of looking at it, that structure is, you know, pretty self-explanatory, pretty basic, pretty well known. But again, it starts to feel like some of those more typical approaches where you're scripting things in that way. And so while this we sort of call the science, 
the value is in improving the narrative. So a lot of plays have everything scripted out, but in improv, and I'm no improv expert, but I'm a huge fan, but in improv, the point is yes and, where you're accepting what is happening to you and you're responding back with something. So you're making a choice, you're making a decision, you're taking an action, you're doing something that contributes to what's happening in this scenario. And by doing that, it allows you as the facilitator and you as participants to have a much more engaging exercise than you would otherwise the, in the case of a very scripted exercise where you must say or must do what is sort of prescribed to you. This adds consequence. It adds impact. It adds success in some cases, in a lot of cases within the exercise. So it's balancing that science of the structure where you need to have a flow in that narrative with the value, which is in the art, where you as the facilitator and as the designer are thinking through all of those different things that could pop up and then thinking on your feet or having some prescripted things that either advance your narrative or introduce some of those complications. We'll get into more detail on that here shortly, but really it's balancing that science and that art. So the best examples that I can think of of something like that are happen to be two of my favorite comedy shows. Um, not always appropriate. Um, so certainly may not be suitable for work. Uh, type watching. But the way that they go about crafting these shows is they have a general outline or that three act structure of, hey, here's where we're starting and here's where we need to get to at the end of the episode or in a particular scene. But a lot of the dialogue that's happening is improv by the actors in that moment. And fortunately for them, they get many, many takes to do different things. But just as we are in an exercise, that is our practice, that is our rehearsal, so to speak, for the real thing. So we can improv and we can make choices in that outline that allow us to get from point A of the scenario to point C or D or Z in the scenario. So when I talk about these things, the the terms that we use with clients and when we're designing things and we actually structure, we don't, we're not necessarily using acts and, you know, we're injecting an improv line. We're really talking about moves, which are the acts. So those major moments of the scenario that we need to have in place in order to progress the exercise in sort of a logical way and get participants to start thinking and doing different things. And it's typically, as I said, set up as the boom, the challenge, and the recovery. And these very rarely change. And you certainly aren't confined to three. We've done four. We've done five. But we really try to avoid those moments because it means you're not getting enough and you're not allowing enough space for the team to react to in those previous moves. But sometimes you need sort of an act four. There might be a different complication in the scenario or the story may just require sort of that fourth move. So it's important to give yourself that benefit of being able to adjust to that. But typically when you get to the point of actually conducting the exercise, those structures aren't, those moves aren't changing. Now that improv portion, we sort of refer to as the injects. So the injects provide a lot of variety of uses and I've touched on a few of these, but some of the things that they can do are they're purposeful injects. So they're progressing the narrative in a certain way that, you know, you need to be able to make that move from one to two. And so there's some key information or some things that need to happen to set up that transition. So those are purposeful injects, but nonetheless, the participants have to react to that new information. You could also be adding a complication or a noise. So you could be adding something that they didn't think about or that is a particular thing that you picked up in a previous exercise that they either didn't do well or somebody noted as, hey, we don't really talk about this. We should really talk about this or you know, give some time to that in a future exercise. Those are those moments where you can add in those complications. And then that noise piece is, what are you adding in that's realistic that may or may not be associated with the exercise? 
or the scenario of the exercise. But the participants have to decipher that question based on that inject. So you don't want to give a lot of noise, but noise is important because that's real too. So as you think about real situations, you get a lot of information that may or may not be true that you have to sort of filter out or filter in. And having that noise allows them to sort of practice, again, that muscle memory of doing that. But the other big thing with the injects is they cause consequences to action or inaction. So these are often not necessarily scripted, and we'll touch on some things here around planning for those, but that causing a consequence to an action is real life. When they make a choice about making a st statement, there's often a reaction to that, good or bad, but there's a reaction. When they choose to prioritize a certain operation over a different operation, there might be a consequence to that. If they decide to ignore a stakeholder's request for information, whether that be a private equity owner or a member of the media or an organization that you work really closely with that has a voice that they can use, if you choose to ignore them, they might start crafting their own narrative about what's happening and that allows you as facilitator and designer to interject that into the exercise, to give them that consequence of you chose not to engage there or make a choice or take an action, there's a consequence. Sometimes we just, there's a good outcome. We actually just recently did an exercise in which we had a, kind of a multi-part inject teed up because we weren't sure if the IT security team or the information security team would engage with that kind of situation or kind of think through that in advance. It turns out they did. So they actually went and addressed that potential issue early on in the conversation and looking at what they would do or and explain sort of what would happen there. And so we didn't play it as a part of the exercise. We kind of allowed it to be a sidebar and say, hey, you you address this in a proactive way, but what happens if you wouldn't have done that or you made a different choice there? What would that look like? And just took a few minutes to allow them to explain to the group what that consequence might look like if they hadn't taken that action. So even in those moments, you can sort of take a temporary pause and explore that. But it's also a space where if they went there and they consistently go there, it's probably not a space you need to practice in the future too heavily. So rewarding them is important too. Now, as I said, some key with the injects, if there's some key narrative pieces to those, you really need to make sure that those are scripted in advance and you can always adjust them as appropriate. So if they're making choices or taking different actions that require that inject to be tweaked slightly, certainly do that. But those injects definitely need to be scripted. But the fun part, I think, as a facilitator and a designer is to be ready to create new ones on the fly. So yes, you're man managing a lot of things and sort of, you know, using the metaphor of juggling a lot of balls in the air as you're kind of working through the exercise. But if you have the right team and you're accounting for that, you may have some other kind of co-facilitators right there with you that you can say, hey, can you create an inject that says this, or we should create something that, you know, forces them to explore that conversation a little more. And being ready to do that on the fly is so much fun, especially when you get that opportunity to punish them a little bit. Um, that probably doesn't come across all that well, but I find a little joy in being able to say, ooh, you missed an opportunity there. Let's kind of turn the heat up a little bit there and see what you do. It's always fun to watch people squirm just a little bit, especially in that safe environment. Certainly if it's real, it's no laughing matter, it's not funny, but in an exercise, you can have a little fun there. So design elements. So we've talked about the structure, we've talked about moves and injects, but let's talk a little bit about the design elements of that scenario. So there's some different things to think about, and I'm not gonna kind of walk through a lot of this in detail, but what I do want to get to is calling out some, some key things here in these kind of four buckets. One is understanding what type of exercise you're doing. 
So that drill we typically think of as we're testing a specific team or process as a part of an overall response, you know, tornado drill or a fire drill, some sort of evacuation process or procedure would fall into that bucket, but it could be, hey, we're just going to simply work through how we account for team members when we might have missing team members in a situation. A tabletop, we typically think of a tabletop as a facilitated discussion where people are talking about the actions that they would take, the choices that they might make, the things that would go into that, explaining some processes, things like that. We're not asking them to actually take the action. It's sort of that walkthrough of what's happening in the scenario and a walkthrough of the process. So again, you're not taking that action. You're simply just kind of moving through it. So everybody gets a feel of how that process works and what would happen in a situation like that. Simulation in contrast is a little bit different. In those, we want the participants to take the action. So if they need to write a situational update after their crisis management team meeting, they need to do that. If they need to design a briefing for the executives, they need to do that. If they need to engage an outside resource, we might simulate some of that, but they actually need to craft the email or call an actor within the exercise to pose those questions to them and then allow that response to then inform how they move forward. So the simulation, we're really asking them to take action and do things. And those are typically much longer than a tabletop. You know, a tabletop you can do in 90 minutes to two hours, three hours, depending on, you know, what kind of resource allocation you have there and how much time you want to take. Simulation is typically more in that six hour range or a couple day range where you're allowing participants to really kind of be immersed in a situation that they have to go from day to day in. Um, and you can certainly take pauses and do different things, but that type of exercise makes a difference in how you're designing and you're designing your moves and things like that. Who needs to be involved? So a lot of times you need to consider who's involved in the exercise. If it's just a particular team, well, it's probably a drill and there's certain design. If it's just your crisis team, well, you know what your audience is and who you have to simulate. You probably have to simulate the executive leadership team or other stakeholders. But if your executives are playing or your third party vendors are playing or other stakeholders might be participating, you want to make sure that you're designing that exercise in a way that addresses those interactions, addresses those players, gives them something to do or choices to make or information, knowledge to share. But you want to make sure that you account for those people. In every exercise, you're not going to hit everybody. Um, certainly in just a, a crisis management team um, exercise, you're not going to hit everybody. There's a lot of hurricanes in which legal doesn't have a big role. And so they don't participate heavily, but it's important that they're there and that they learn and that they're able to share information if things come up. But in the real life, as a part of your process, you may say, look, we don't really need you right now. We'll call you back. And they're able to go back to their day job. But with a training and an exercise, you're sort of dedicating that time as a collective team. And it's important to be together as a team. But you definitely want to give as many people things to do as possible, especially your executives, especially your third party vendors, you know, your guests, so to speak, in that particular scenario, you want to make sure they have something to do. The logistics of the exercise play a huge part too, and they can work to your advantage. So what is the date and time of the exercise? The time of year matters. The time of day might matter in how you're crafting a scenario. In a retail environment, Q3, very busy time in the supply chain world. You're getting all of your goods to, to your stores in order to sell for Q4, the big, big part of the year for the holidays and things like that. You want to make sure that you're taking advantage of that if you're doing a supply chain scenario in Q3. That adds a lot of complication organically and some challenges and some noise that might be helpful in designing that exercise. It's important not to do a hurricane in the middle of January. That's not very realistic. Um, but you certainly can, but doing it during hurricane season 
absolutely adds an element of realism that might be kind of interesting to, to undertake. How long is the exercise matters? So you want to make sure that you're giving enough space for conversation, enough inject to move them along and to challenge them or to give them other things to think about, but you don't want to overwhelm them. You don't want to give them too much where they can't kind of process. That becomes unrealistic too. Now, certainly at the start of you know, a really chaotic or acute incident, there's a lot of stuff going on. There's a lot of chaos and stress and trying to sort things out. That's important, but to do it in an exercise isn't necessarily always effective. It might be in a simulation where you want to kind of get them worked up for a couple hours at the start, but in a tabletop, you don't have that much time to, to allocate to that. So you want to make sure that you're giving them something that they can make some choices against and then start having that conversation and, and learning and growing. And then is it in-person? Is it virtual? Is it both? That matters too in terms of both how you're delivering some of those injects or information to participants and how you're coordinating amongst yourselves as evaluators, facilitators, observers, things like that. But it also matters in terms of the complications that you can use. You may have to shut down teams as a part of it and introduce that challenge to say, hey, you can't talk as you normally would on Teams or Zoom or whatever method you're using. You might shut off a instant message platform that you're using. So Slack might be down or Teams or some other platform that you might be using. And then finally, that difficulty level matters as well. And it's really important to understand that there are a lot of different elements in that difficulty conversation. And some of the things that come into play are, most importantly, is it their first time getting together? You don't want to make something that's crazy difficult or crazy chaotic for the first time. You want them to get grounded in the process. You want them to feel comfortable in that process. You want something that they can manage and work through. It doesn't need to be easy, but it needs to be something that they can engage with. It can't be you're requiring them to eat the entire elephant. It might just be you're requiring them to have a really big salad. But nonetheless, they got to eat it. Um, so it's a matter of striking that right balance. If it's the first or the fifth or the 99th, as we sort of describe here, that matters and how difficult you know you can make the scenario. It also matters in terms of what they've done before. So have they done a ton of hurricanes? Have they done all sorts of data in, you know, ransomware over and over and over again? Are they doing different things that, you know, are just sort of routine or obvious? Maybe it's time to shift that in a different direction, or maybe it's time to make that transition from a hurricane as a tabletop to a hurricane as a simulation. So really understanding what they've done before and what they haven't done is really important. A really important question I think that is often lost or overlooked or dismissed in conversations is, are they ready for that type of incident? Now, in the real world, things are gonna happen and they just have to be ready for it. But again, when you're designing an exercise and you want it to be effective and you wanna build that confidence and learning and understanding and that prep, you can't make them go fight a high rise fire again when you need them to just feel comfortable with the emotions of that process of fighting a house fire. A couple examples that I often give to clients when we're talking through this is, you know, a lot of people want to do a data incident and they're great. There's a lot of different things you can do with a data incident and they're also very important. And I understand why they want to do those things. But the problem is they're often very highly technical and there's not a lot of broad organizational knowledge about the processes and intricacies and things like that that have come into play. And so if they haven't done those before, or you don't have a group that's well-versed or experienced in something like that, there's a lot of different ways that those can go poorly in terms of that effectiveness and that collaboration space. There's a lot of opportunities for people to have to explain different things, for people to have to understand different things in know in order to get through that exercise. So you may want to start with just small portions of a data incident. You know, a process doesn't work or an application fails, you know, that might be critical, but that's the only thing you're sort of breaking. You're not necessarily ripple affecting 
lots of technical pieces. You can ripple affect the reputational fallout or the operational challenges that come with that application, you know, not being available. But you definitely don't want to make it overly technical. As you evolve and you mature and you get to that 99th exercise, you absolutely should be technical on what we're talking about there and designing an exercise in that fashion. The other example that I use here for, are they ready for that, is active assailant. Now, a lot of people, active assailant, active shooter, workplace violence, any of those kind of things where there's often you know some pretty traumatic things that are happening as a part of that, there's a lot of emotion that comes with that. And there's a lot of different nuances that happen there that groups might not be ready for, or there might have been a previous incident that they're now practicing for that you have to be sensitive to and, and think about. You know, those are more common than we'd like in sort of today's environment. Um, there's a lot of coverage, a lot of awareness to those things. So you just want to make sure that you're thinking about that type of incident or a highly technical incident in a way that's going to, again, empower the team to actually be able to work the problem and not just simply give them something that has a lot of nuance or a lot of comp organic complication within it right out of the gate. And then creating the right practice conditions. So you want to make sure that you know, you're setting up the right decision points, you're setting up the right actions that they may or may not take, the right areas of engagement between teams within the crisis management team or, you know, a particular part of the organization. And then again, understanding who's participating. Um, you know, I know we talked about that as who needs to be involved, but it's really important here in looking at that to say, look, we've tested our primary members of our crisis management team for the last five exercises. Our backups really haven't got a chance to play. So elevating that difficulty or shifting that difficulty in a sense where those primary players have probably gotten really good at what they've done and they're ready for you know, some really difficult things. We can increase that difficulty, but the backups aren't. So you may have to look at, okay, we're doing a backups only exercise. We need to kind of shift back down in the difficulty and bring them back up. You know, really that crawl, walk, run sort of mentality. We can't expect the backups to be ready to run if they haven't got that opportunity to practice crawling and walking. And that's not to say that they're not capable of doing that or they're not experienced or they couldn't just do it if they needed to. They, I'm sure they certainly could. It's a lot of capable people. That's why they're on the... That's why they're on those teams. But you want to make sure in these exercises, again, that you're setting them up for success. So how do you build that cohesion with them or understanding of the process in a way that makes sense? So now that we sort of talked about basic designs and we're really looking at what kind of the outcome of all that stuff needs to be, it's really important to think about when it comes to the difficulty and the way that you're designing those is to remember that an exercise isn't supposed to be the Kobayashi Maru. Now that's a reference to Star Trek in which Spock has designed a scenario when he's a part of sort of Starfleet headquarters for all cadets and officers that to kind of work through that's impossible. There is a no win outcome to that. And it's designed in that way. The logic of it, as Spock would probably say, is that you can't win. And the only way you could win is to cheat, um, which is what Captain Kirk does. So not to go too far into Star Trek, uh, more of a Star Wars fan myself. But the point being, you want to make sure that that exercise isn't impossible for them. There has to be a sense of, wow, that was tough. Oof, that was brutal. But we got through it. We learned some things. We're capable of getting through that. And that's, again, where that kind of third act comes into play. And we leverage that is to make that transition of like, that was really tough what we were doing in move one and move two. But maybe look at all the things you've done over the last two weeks and you're in a better place. Now let's start thinking about what that better place might look like or continue to look like. So not impossible with the Kobayashi Maru, but it's also not everybody wins where you're wrapping it up in a nice little bow either. Where it's, oh, look, you solved the problem and everybody's happy with you again. That's not real. Those things don't happen. There is fallout. There is impact. There is disruption that happens with crises and emergency responses and things like that. They're 
there's all sorts of impact that happens after something like that. And you need to make sure that people are aware that those are real things that are going to happen. So they can't feel terrible and they can't feel great at the end. You got to strike the Goldilocks of just right. Elevating the exercise. And we've talked through a few of these things, but it, kind of thinking through what are some things that you can do to elevate that exercise in terms of that design and some of the elements and some of the creativity that you can inject. Base it on a true story. That really helps with dealing with that problem of, well, this could never happen. That's impossible. It is possible. You we based it on a true story. So that immediately helps build that realism within. And it also gives you a lot of creative ideas in terms of impacts and consequences that may have happened before that you can tweak and adjust. Again, actions have consequences, both good and bad. So make sure that you're striking that right balance with those injects of building those consequences. It's really important to have consequences in there. Build that writer's room of experts. So making sure that if you have a really technical or really operationally kind of tricky scenario that you have the right experts in the room informing the way that you're designing things to make sure that you're you're getting it right without being kind of overly technical or overly complicated. You're striking that right balance of making sure that there's that realism, but also, you know, that ability to progress the story. Callbacks and Easter eggs are always fun. So injecting little things within your exercises or things that you've done previously that may have been a funny moment or a moment of levity or something that sort of always pops up, seems to pop up when you're responding to something, injecting those in often gives, again, that moment of levity, that sense of, oh yeah, you know, this person is reaching out before. We often use a, a pretty prominent um, cybersecurity um, journalist as one of our callbacks in a lot of our exercises where he just sort of pops up over and over and over again in, in some form or fashion um, within the exercises. And it, we use them in a lot of creative ways to, again, inject some good information, but also have a little funny moment in there too. And that that builds that team building, that cohesion that, that you want. Creating stress and pressure and realism, it's impossible and you never would want to create the trauma of an active assailant situation, but there are things that you can do to replicate some of that stress or some of that kind of fear or anxiety in the way that you're designing things or what you're introducing into different scenarios that sort of builds the conditions that people would need to operate in. So there's a not necessarily the desensitized, but they're aware and they're able to kind of move through those things. So where you can use those things, be purposeful and intentional, not gratuitous with them, but purposeful. It needs to have a purpose of why it's in there. Even if it seems a little odd, it might just be there to replicate that sense of stress and pressure. And then delivery of information. So be creative in the way that you're injecting that, whether it's a phone call, it's a fake news story, it's somebody talking, it's an email, it's... Uh, fake spam, all sorts of things you can do there. And then from a war game standpoint, and war game is often used to sort of play out in the geopolitical sense or military sense or intel sense of what, what another actor or actors might do in particular situations. So it's really important as the designer to really think through what choices might the participants make? What resources might they consider using? What decisions or actions do you want them to consider as a part of this. So oftentimes, you know, in some things like a data breach, we want them to make a decision on when they would engage, you know, law enforcement. And we need to make sure that we're building in some elements in there that prompt them to do that. So it might be having law enforcement reach out or have a news article or an intelligence document come through that kind of nudges them in a way of maybe we should talk to them. They might have information or we should really report this or we really need their expertise, but prompting them, you know, again, to make a decision there. And then who do we need to engage? So we need to make sure that we understand, okay, if X, Y, and Z happens, these teams are probably going to go to this team. So 
if this team is going to become involved, we should either get them engaged, get them ready, or talk with them and prepare some things in advance that we can use to help build some injects or inform the questions that you know those teams might ask of that other part of the organization. So we've talked a lot about this. Again, I'm not gonna cover through this. You can read sort of what's on the screen, but it's really important to create that realism within your exercise. And so there's a lot of different things that you can do that. And we've touched on many of these. Some things that I would call out that we haven't necessarily talked about before are removing some of those key players. So if there's a key leader or a set of experts that this group is dependent upon or has really leveraged, or it's just time, to sort of remove the primary crisis leader or incident leader from an exercise and make the backup kind of go on the spot and create some realism there or a backup, you know, less consequential, um, you know, somewhere within, you know, the crisis management team that may not have a heavy role, but you're going to remove the primary person from that. Do the, do that. It's a great opportunity for those backups or other people to step in and, and have, that support, hopefully, from the rest of the team. But it's also important from a learning standpoint to really understand that we, well, we are really dependent on that person in order for us to have a successful response. We have not done enough to make sure that our other crisis leaders are trained and ready. Um, some other things, you know, in terms of creating noise, so introducing some intelligence updates or news reports or things like that at the beginning that sort of set the scene of not quite sure what it is that we're really engaged with quite yet in the scenario, but we're alluding to some different things, but can also be opportunities to inject some kind of upfront noise that they have to sort of sift through. Um, escalating some different things. So if a group was pretty intended to be pretty peaceful, but we've made some decisions that we think would, you know, make them pretty hostile, um, based on what we've decided, do that. Just flip those injects, create new injects that, that make them hostile. So there's a lot of different ideas sort of on this slide here in terms of creating that realism. And there's a lot of different things that, you know, you may come up with that, or things that we've done in the past that we haven't necessarily captured here, but there's a lot of different opportunities to sort of simulate some of that realism and create some different conditions that are interesting and obviously purposeful to what it is that you're trying to accomplish there. So now that we've talked about exercise design, you know, what I really want to do is kind of quickly walk through a case study here that we've used previously uh, with one of our clients. And it really gives you a sense of how we've structured some things and what we've done to deliver that exercise. So when we get into the move slides, these are really the slides that we've sort of used. Obviously, we've changed some of the details here um, to make it anonymous. But to give some background, you know, this was an exercise for a global restaurant company. So this company does pretty well in revenue, uh, $3.6 billion. They're based in the U.S., but they have over 7,500 locations in 20 different countries. The challenge or the purpose of the exercise, in addition to some different things, but sort of the goals and the challenges we wanted to introduce were that limited redundancy that they had in their food supply chain. They were exercising for less than a year as a crisis management team with a newer capability. And they have a complicated franchisee model. So those were some different things that led to the way that we sort of crafted this scenario. So I'm going to quickly walk through these, um, but we sort of set them up on a Thursday at towards the end of the workday, so 4 p.m. Central Time in the U.S. But we had a strong weather system move across the southeast U.S., which is a pretty common time for storms to move, but it produced heavy rain, hail, strong winds, and then several tornadoes. And so as a consequence of that, in this move one, we really started to feed them information here where okay here's what we know there's some some damage to some different franchisees it's multiple states they're indicating that some locations have customers still inside and that it's not easy for them to leave based on some of the damage 
And then the storm size and strength, you know, there's some varying levels of damage. Some sites are very catastrophic. Others wasn't so much. But nonetheless, it's generating a lot of local and national media. So within what we've set up here in Move 1 is it feels like you're sort of sitting in front of a news report and you're getting the sense of how bad and how difficult this storm is. But now you add in the layer of we're an organization and here's some information that we know in detail to our organization. Now we need to start making some choices and doing some different things. And so some of the narrative injects that we injected here were really around, you know, their franchisees reporting cleanup was underway. Um, many expected to be open by Monday. So we're, again, we're Thursday, a few days. Some think they'll, they'll be able to open back up. We introduced some of the biggest complications isn't necessarily the damage, but it's the restoration of power and cleaning the debris. And because those really play impacts into food storage, food safety, other choices that they have to make as a result of the power being out. We also gave them some information that, you know, none of their sort of corporate or field-based employees or, you know, other folks were necessarily impacted as a part of that. It's really sort of contained uh, kind of franchisees and um, some of their teams, but also knowing that, you know, there's no significant impact at this point to, to any of those people. And then no vendors or suppliers have reached out at this time to say they have any disruption or there's been any impact to them. So again, important information for them to know as a part of this. And where that comes into play is move two, where all of a sudden we are now providing them with the really major challenge here. So they know what's happened to them so far. Now they're learning the next day, the next morning, that their primary source of hamburger has been impacted. And it's not just in Georgia where that plant is based. It impacts a lot of the region and a lot of the U.S. in terms of where that, that information is coming from. Now, as a part of that, we introduce some details around what's happened at that structure so that there's that sense of realism that it isn't simply the, oh, the tornado came through and blew the building down. It's kind of boring. We gave them some different complications that are impactful and really serious and significant, but also allows us to play from a facilitator, facilitator standpoint, excuse me, with how bad that might end up being based on some choices they make or some assumptions that they may have where it's, ah, that's not a big deal. Or they'll be back up and running. We can then say, oh, nope, they're reporting, you know, more damage than they thought and, you know, they could play out. So it gives us some latitude to be able to play in. And then some concern regarding hazardous chemical um, and tanks. So that's, those are all really important things that are real consequences in, in some of these situations. Again, from an inject standpoint, we introduced that it's not just their burger supplier, but their soft serve or their ice cream supplier has informed that they also have damage and it's really making an impact to their inventory supplies. It's really hard to keep ice cream frozen when there's no power to run the, run the freezers. Their saw supplier is also without power, power and had some minor damage. So giving them some, probably a less meaningful supplier, but nonetheless, it's a complication. It's multiple suppliers having problems. And that plays an impact on some of their products. And then alternate product vendors are indicating that they're having delays in getting to Georgia or getting to some of these areas where these primary suppliers are based would be, you know, providing product to because of the storm damage, some of these alternative vendors can't get there easily. And it's at least 48 hours. So they now have to logistically plan for different choices and things like that. And then finally for move three, we skip ahead in time a couple weeks and we indicate to them that, you know, Look, their crisis management team has remained activated and, and meeting daily, and the response activities are winding down, but the discussion is really focused on shifting to recovery needs. So not only is it meeting you know, daily and talking through these things and the situation is improving, but now they're starting to think about, ah, oh, that recovery piece, what do, we, what do we do? So now it's been two weeks since the storm has hit. 
they know that the immediate impacts to their kind of locations have been resolved. But those operational challenges that those vendors have remained uh, because of their burger patty and ice cream and things like that. And so they're looking at at least six more weeks of disruption from their hamburger supplier and another couple of weeks from their ice cream. So now in this conversation, they know they're sort of okay, but their impact is still being felt by these other dependencies that they have. And so what would they do to sort of plant through that? So that is sort of the design of that exercise in a nutshell to give you an example. So, you know, really we kind of give that boom, we introduce the challenge, and then we really shift them into a recovery mindset, you know, feeding them the right injects to sort of position them, them there in a sense as they move through. So again, as you're thinking about that scenario development and you kind of address some of those design elements and questions and things like that, and those key, that key question of what's the purpose, you're really into, you're gonna design that scenario and you've picked it, you understand it, you know, in terms of what you're going to do. Now you need to craft those moves. So what are those three structures that you're going to build? What are some of those injects that you need in order to make those transitions? What are some injects that you think you're going to need to have prepared? What are some injects that might be simply distraction that you want to introduce there to challenge them a little bit? And then what are some things that they might do that you want to be prepared for in advance? And then obviously be ready with brand new things. Then you're going to build out your plan. So you're going to take all of that information you've done and kind of one, two, and three here, and you're going to lay out what your plan is. So that includes how you're going to introduce that information. How are you going to present that information? How are you going to communicate those different things? So it's really important to sort of flush out that plan and really understand it. And then lastly, once you sort of have buy-off with all of those different things in one through four, that's the time that we typically take to then say, okay, we have our scenario, we have everything crafted out. Now, you know, we have a few days till the exercise. Let's start to build the materials of that. So we're going to build those fake social media posts or the videos or emails from a third party. You already have the index design. Now you just need to put them in a format where they seem realistic or creative or you know, give a sense of difficulty that you want within the exercise. So we've talked a lot about designing an exercise, but there's also some other important elements of kind of creating and designing that effective exercise that are really important to touch on here that aren't necessarily in the kind of scripting of the story and writing of the story. It's more in the, you know, if we're going to kind of take that TV element here, you know, we've sort of done the writing. We know what the story is going to be. Now we need to sort of talk about the directing and the participation sides of things so that we're really understanding kind of how this is going to play out in a really effective way. And so we touch on a few things here in terms of kind of other elements of exercises, and we'll probably do future presentations in detail around some of these, but I, I want to touch on these at a high level because they do make a difference in design. So facilitating an exercise is obviously really important. We've talked a lot about it from that inject standpoint, but you really want to make sure that from a best practice standpoint that you've assigned the right roles and responsibilities. So you know who your facilitators are, the people that are running, sort of directing the flow of the exercise, your evaluators and observers, the people that are watching, that are sort of assessing what's happening and looking for different things, those observations and opportunities and wins and things like that. Who's playing? And then who are your actors? So who might just jump in for a quick phone call and then step out and go back to their day job? You know, make sure that you've assigned those correctly and to the people that are, are going to be available. Plan for communication. So make sure that you are conversing and coordinating during the exercise and understanding how you're going to do that. So is it you're going to be sitting next to each other? You're going to be using something like Microsoft Teams or Slack or email. Making choices around that matters. So text or you know having a separate bridge isn't always the most effective. It's too much noise. It's too slow. Um, IMs, instant message platforms are often best um, if you're not able to sit right next to each other and sort of whisper uh, devious ideas back and forth. 
another opportunity is record the exercise. So record it, you know, Zoom, Teams, all these platforms have recording capabilities. You can also go out and source other additional software that integrates well with some of these platforms that you can record this exercise, but record it. it not necessarily from a performance evaluation. You want to make sure you make that clear for the participants that you're not grading them on what's happening, but that you're really looking at it from a, hey, we just want to document all the great things that are happening in here and all the kind of juicy nuggets of information that we want to extract. We want to make sure we capture that. And it's also a frees you up from a facilitation standpoint and even an evaluator, observer, and participant to know that you can just kind of keep playing and that information is still documented. So if you miss something, it's okay. You can go back and listen. Talked about prepping those injects before. It's really important. But it's also important to kind of bookmark some of those templates or um, generators on the internet that you can use to create a, you know, superficial, you know, tweet or Facebook post or something else. You want to have those ready to go um, in case you might need them. So the opportunity to ri arises that you can leverage those. And then make sure you distinguish between what's required from an inject standpoint for those narrative purposes and then what's optional. So if you have some things that you think you might play, just mark those as optional so you know you don't have to and that helps you balance the time and facilitate a little, little easier. And then have fun. So talked about a lot of different things here as we've gone through, but be creative, be devious when appropriate. Um, don't be gratuitous, but you can be devious. And then make sure you let the story evolve. So if they're going to into really good places or having really good conversation around how they would figure something out or an opportunity that sort of popped up that they haven't considered before, give them that space to sort of explore that without necessarily going down a rabbit hole. So you're going to have to judge a little bit on when they've sort of exhausted the conversation and they need to move on. But make sure that you let that story evolve and that you're not too quick to just rapid fire injects in. Um, it sort of overwhelms and it also isn't necessarily organic to the way that you probably want to do things or you would handle things in real life. And then learning from the exercise. So making sure that you're taking that time in effective exercises and designing these things is to learn from them. We've talked a lot about that you're giving them a lot of space to play and opportunities to make decisions and fail and succeed and do crazy things and creative things and interesting things. Learn from it. So a couple of things that we often do in the hot wash portion, so that's what we call that kind of after action portion at the end of the exercise when we sort of said, yep, we are done with gameplay. Now let's go into our hot wash portion. We'll often recap what that true story is that we base the exercise on to make sure that again, anybody who was doubting it before is suddenly like, oh, they did do their due diligence here. They did base this in reality. It's not completely made up. Um, there's always going to be artificialities in an exercise, time constraints, things like that. But from kind of the core scenario, okay, there's, there's some realism there. I guess I got to buy in better next time. If I wasn't buying in great this time, but it also allows you to kind of prompt them in terms of sharing different lessons learned because you can share what other organizations learned or some different, you know, gaps or opportunities that may have come up that informs when you get to that portion of the conversation with them in terms of what went well, what did we do? What did we like? What was new that we want to repeat? Or what were the opportunities or gaps? What are the things we didn't do well? What are the processes we didn't follow or the resources we didn't use? Thinking through those things. And then most importantly, is starting to get them to move towards what actions do you want to take to improve? So stating specific things that they want to do and capturing those is really important. And then after taking that time, we typically allow 10 to 15 minutes to sort of have that hot wash conversation. We'll wrap up the exercise, but we'll tell them that, you know, hey, as a part of this exercise process, we're going to give you a little time to digest what just happened. We're going to provide you a survey at the end, tomorrow, typically within 24 hours or, you know, later in the day or whatever the case is. But you give them about a week to return that survey, but you give them time to sort of digest and reflect on what's happened. 
and it allows them to give good information later on. You want to keep those short five to 10 minute surveys, 10 to 12 questions, you know, sort of a mix of multiple choice or, or single choice with some opportunity to, to give some, some text, some additional thoughts and feedback. So some sample questions here, how effective was the team? How effective was the team's response? What were, you know, three things that went well? What were three opportunities for improvement? What scenarios should we consider in the future? So some different ideas there. And the big thing is make sure you keep these surveys anonymous. So you want to make sure that, again, as you probably stated in, in the ground rules of your exercise at the beginning, this isn't performance-based. It's you're not judging individual people from a performance standpoint. You're judging the team and the process. And, you know, you might have findings, you know, in there, but that's not really the intent of what this is. And you really shouldn't be looking to punish people out of this. You should be looking at the, okay, they didn't do this and it didn't go well, but why? Let's understand the why. And then let's try and correct that to make sure that somebody else doesn't fall into that same trap or that same vein of response. And then that after action reports, so you're taking all that information together that you've learned in the hot wash and other conversations and the survey, and you're really making sure that you're giving a good overview of what was learned and what happened in that exercise. And it's typically within two to three weeks of the exercise any longer, and you're really wasting that opportunity. You're not capitalizing on the momentum that you have out of the exercise. People are still in a good space. There's, it's still fresh on top of people's minds. You want to make sure that you're continuing to drive that opportunity forward in terms of improving and maturing. When you get six weeks out, eight weeks out, you, you're losing people. They're not going to remember what that action was that they needed to take. So being really clear, and laying out what the exercise was, giving good observations that are clear and factual about what happened, not opinions, just observations. What happened? What did they do well? What didn't go so well? From an evaluator standpoint or a facilitator standpoint, you know, yes, there's probably some little bit of opinion in there, but you're grading them against, you know, the process and, you know, things that, you know, they should capitalize on and things like that moving forward. So you want to make it as factual about what happened and as observation-based as possible. And then those recommendations should be really clear about the actions that should be undertaken and really clear about assigning role and owner and a timeline to those actions. You don't want them to just linger out, out there. You want them to drive forward in something. And then from a maturity model standpoint, this is more for reference, you know, as you're thinking about where you sit currently in your exercise maturity as an organization, this is sort of the spectrum that we lay out from, you know, non-existent where there's nothing being done from an exercise standpoint to that defined strategy where you're running simulations that are incorporated into that strategy, into certifications and other requirements and regulatory obligations that you might have, but it's all integrated. You're having, you know, simulations or exercises where you're testing multiple parts of your organization or outside vendors, but you have a defined strategy. You're doing it over and over and over again in the same way. And you have a purpose to what you're doing and there's a structure and a flow to what's happening. And you have a, a set cadence of what that looks like. So if you want to know more about this section, you can certainly, you know, we encourage you to reach out to us and, you know, we can have some conversations around, you know, what this might look might look like for your organization and, you know, different ideas on, on where to go to evolve that. And finally, I've, I've talked a lot. It's, you know, it's been a really good session in terms of talking through what, what an effective sort of design of an exercise looks like. I want to recap a few of the key points that I think are important to take away here, the like keys to success, as I'm calling it here. So base it on a true story. Builds realism and credibility right out the gate. 
And it also gives you an opportunity to pull from a real life incident in ways that you may not have been thinking before and thinking through different kind of unique challenges or impacts that may have come from them. Establish clear goals and objectives for the exercise. So again, right out the gate, clear goals and objectives. Understand what it is you're trying to do. Don't just check the box with an exercise. It's the worst thing you can do. It, it really does become that poison to what it is you're trying to do. Explore where the story might go and plan accordingly, but be ready to react. So allow them that latitude to go explore what's happening. Plan for what you think they might do in those situations or where you want them to go, but be ready to react if they make interesting choices or they take care of a situation before you're, you've even introduced it. Be ready to react and then think of new challenges or new consequences that might come into play as a result. Again, exercises are like three-act improv plays. So you have that fundamental structure and organization to the exercise narrative, but you want to make sure that you're giving realism in the form of injects and different consequences and things that would happen in real life that they can't just make a decision and be like, we win. They need to feel the weight of that decision, good or bad. They need to feel the weight of that. Leverage your subject matter experts to get those details right. Really important. Again, back up to based on a true story. This is just as important to make sure that from an organization standpoint and how your different operations and things work, that you understand you know, those details to get it right. Ironically, uh, to this presentation, presentation at least, is keep it tight. Um, prepare that run of play identify those potential forks in the road and then avoid those constraints. So make sure you're watching as you're designing and you're listening to them react where you might be trapped from a narrative standpoint or from a response standpoint and see if you can't nudge them either away or in the pre-design of the exercise, avoid some of those constraints up out of the gate, whether that's just recognizing that that's a constraint and we're not really going to explore that in great detail or design it in such a way that you force them away from that in its entirety. And then finally, make it engaging, collaborative, and appropriately challenging. Again, the worst thing you want to do is design an exercise in which people aren't going to react, or they're going to be dismissive, or they don't feel like they had opportunities to connect with each other and collaborate and take action and think of creative kind of outcomes in their response. Structure it in a way that creates some of that fun and that engagement there um, for as much fun as you can have um, when dealing with some pretty serious stuff that some of these scenarios can have. So I really appreciate you taking the time to kind of listen to the presentation here in this session around how you can better find that value in designing those, those exercises in different ways and being a little bit more creative. If you do have any more questions or you want more information, um, I don't know how I might have missed something here, but if there is more information, please do comment below um, in this video, or you can certainly email me um, at bray.wheeler at brightpath.com. Again, thank you everybody for for watching and we will see you in our next session. Thanks for watching our video. To learn more about how to manage uncertainty and disruption in your organization, be sure to like, follow, and subscribe to our video channel. And here are a few more videos that we've selected that will help you learn more about business continuity, crisis management, and crisis communications.